Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for calling in on time to the Libertarian Party conference call with Judge Jim Gray. I am Jess Mears, and I am the Libertarian Party's membership manager. The Libertarian Party is pleased to have with us on the call tonight our new executive director, Dan Fishman, who just started his first day on Monday. And he's going to, if you don't mind, give a moment of your time to say hello to everyone. Hi, Dan. Thank you. Hi, Jess. Thank you so much for having me on, and I want to thank the people who dialed in to this phone call, because one of the most important things that convinced me to take the job as the executive director is the strength of the membership and the people who are willing to come in, learn, participate, and then spread and evangelize the idea of liberty. And we are lucky to have on this phone call one of the people that I consider the great evangelist for the cause. Judge Jim Gray. I had the great good fortune to introduce Judge Gray when he was a Libertarian vice presidential candidate in 2012, and he came to Boston. And I was struck then at the fact that when he was up and addressing the crowd, everybody was wrapped in attention. He was talking about the ideas that something we understand, liberty is indeed a blessing that is given to us. And when he talks about the changes that he envisions for the judicial system, the injustice in the world, and the expansion of the liberty movement, he represents the best of what we can be. And so I want to thank everybody who got onto this phone call, and I want to especially thank you, Judge Gray, for giving to us of your time in this place. And thank you all. Thank you, Dan. I have a few more words about how we're going to moderate this call. Judge Jim Gray, he's our highly esteemed guest this evening. He's going to have the first portion of the call dedicated to his remarks. The last 20 or 30 minutes will be live Q&A. We have everyone on this call muted to prevent feedback. So if you would like to ask a question for Judge Jim Gray, please send me an email at jess.mears at lp.org, or you can just respond to the email reminder that I sent out earlier. So at this time, I'm going to unmute Judge Jim Gray, and I'm, I'm going to hand the call over to him. Good evening, Judge. Well, in fact, good evening, Jess. And uh, as I was joking with you a few minutes ago, a lot of people have tried to mute me in my uh, professional life. Uh, you're the only one that's been successful, but thank you for unmuting me as well. You know, life, life really welcome. is good. And Dan, thank you for those kind comments, and congratulations uh, to give the mantle to such a good, efficient, caring fellow. Uh, I know that we're going to all uh, mutually benefit from, from that experience. But, but good right. evening to everyone. I, I can tell you that uh, I was a lifelong Republican until the passage of the so-called Patriot Act, and I just could not be involved in any group that would assist um, or condone even, this direct frontal attack on our civil liberties. And so I'd never really thought about the Libertarian Party that much, but once I came to that conclusion, it took me a, literally 13 seconds to say, hey, I am a Libertarian, and, and I'm proud to be a Libertarian. And when I go out and, and talk with people, uh, I frequently introduce myself as, hello, I'm Judge Jim Gray, I'm a Libertarian, and, and I'm proud to be. Most people do not know what we stand for. And we have made a colossal mistake since the early 1970s when we came into existence because we've allowed other people to brand us. And that comes out with things like, oh, greed is good. And Ian Rand made a, made a mistake, at least from, the, from our standpoint, in, in coining that phrase and, and saying it's good. She, she meant if you act in your own best legal, financial interests, well, that's a good thing, which of course it is. But uh, So we're seen as being greedy. We're seen as being survival of the fittest. Uh, we're seen as, oh, everything goes, uh, no government, uh, you know, open borders, all that sorts of things. And we need, we must change that. We must take it into our own hands and show people what libertarians really are. And I would commend to you that uh, Thomas Jefferson is a prototype libertarian. And one comment he made, and I use this frequently, and I recommend that, that all of us do, uh, I don't care if you worship one god, 20 gods, or no god. It doesn't pick my pocket and it doesn't break my leg. I mean, that's pretty much where we are. Uh, live and let live. 
as long as you don't hurt me and take my stuff sort of thing. So I think mo- a lot of people will, will understand that. Phraseology matters. It makes a huge difference. Uh, Milton Friedman, a, a hero of mine, a, a, a wonderful man, said, liberty is to be stressed, but where government is involved, it should strive for a world in which people are held responsible for their own behavior and are able to profit from their own industry. Wow, what a statement. You know, of course. I mean, that goes on to say that there's never been a society in the history of mankind that has raised itself up out of poverty, except through a system of private property rights and freedom, free enterprise system. So people need to Today, we are almost demonizing people in our society who've been successful. Oh, oh, they're not paying their fair share, which just drives me up a wall. Uh, Of course, you know, taxes are too high, and we can go through all that as well. But we should be proud and use the label libertarian. And and I use that. uh, I write columns. In fact, any of you that would like to receive what I send out every Monday and have for the last three years called Two Paragraphs for Liberty and I send it out on my email address. Uh, Jess can get you my email if, you, if she wants to, or if she would. Uh, it's Jim P. Gray, G-R-A-Y, Jim P. Gray at sbcglobal.net. Contact me, and I'd be happy to put you on my list. There's another thing as well, that I just have a draft of something I call One Man's Libertarian White Paper, and it basically cuts through a lot of things as to who we are, what libertarians are, what our principles are, what our various spokespeople are, and then the winners and the losers in a libertarian type of government. And uh, we'll, we'll go over a few of those things as I, as I move on, but, but if you'd be interested in getting that, uh, I sent a copy to Jess, and she can make a copy available for you. It's only a draft. I don't purport to speak for the Libertarian Party. That's why I say one man's Libertarian white paper. I certainly don't have all the answers, and I'll probably prove that 17 times in the next 20 minutes, but uh, I do believe that it's fully appropriate and correct to be able to discuss anything. Not argue, not not yell at each other, but just to discuss. And in fact, uh, in mentoring our children, and I have an opportunity to do that with some frequency of high school and college age children or young people, uh, I tell them that the word listen, it's amazing, the word listen has the same letters in it as the word silent. And being silent, you can't listen if you're speaking, and you can't learn if you're speaking. So we need to listen more, and we also just need to settle down and discuss issues openly, fully, and listen to each other and throw the dialogue around. I always ask for feedback. I'll ask for feedback from you today. Feedback is healthy, and uh, just as a, as a judge. In fact, I was doing this today as a discovery referee. I give out some tentative opinions, and then I have no pride of authorship. If, I, if somebody says that, no, you missed out on Exhibit Q, or, or you forgot this argument or whatever, I'll change my mind. I, I'm trying to do it right. And, and all of these issues are really complicated in today's world, but at least we can be able to talk with each other and get away from this polarization. How did we become so polarized? And I have a couple of answers for that because it's just it's shocking to me how polarized we are. And one of them was when we started coming out with all these cable TV networks. And I thought to myself, wrongly, wow, that's going to be wonderful. We're all going to be exposed to a variety of different issues, variety of different, different objections and, and, and objectives. And boy, was I wrong because what has actually happened is you will find various TV stations that find out what your interests are, and then they cater to them. I'm sorry, I have a ambulance going by behind me, so I can't blot that out, unless, Jess, you can mute it, but uh, at any rate. But so we, in effect, find these various stations that will know what your thoughts are, and then they just cater to it. And so we get blinders on, try this yourself, or have your family and friends try this. Sometime there'll be a, an important news event in our country. Look at CNN and watch how it is presented. They'll have the names the same, but otherwise pretty much everything is different from MSNBC or Fox News or KABC. You know, it's just a shame that we do that. So try to listen to other stations. Try to expand your horizons there. Another one is that we have uh, these elections in uh, uh, in primary elections, and, and we simply... <laughs> 
focus on those as opposed to the common interest of the of the entire country. Uh, and another one, you know, we, we get so polarized that we simply cannot talk to each other, and we simply must come away from that. So, what are some? Who would be some winners in a libertarian government? And that one of the big issues that we should stand up on and and tout is school choice. Don't talk about it so much that way. Say, bring competition into our school and educational system. And I was talking with Milton Friedman one time. We were actually at a drug policy issue back in 1993 and uh, at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. And I was listening to him during a recess talk about school choice. And I said, well, Dr. Friedman, I'm a product of public schools. I don't want to do anything that would undercut the public schools and, and which gave me such a good education. And he said, Jim, I'm going to ask you two questions, okay? The question number one is, where in the world would you want your child to go into high school to get the best education that he or she could get? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but probably not the United States of America. He said, I think you're right. <clears throat> the second question is, where in the world would you want your college age child to go to get the best education that he or she could. I said, well, I'm not really sure, but I think probably the United States of America. He said, I agree with you as well. The difference is you can choose where your money is going to be spent for college so they have competition. You cannot in high school. He converted me to school choice at that moment. And now, of course, we have the benefit uh, and of seeing the results. So you don't just have to guess and, and anticipate what will happen. In fact, when I was running for vice president in 2012, uh, as a libertarian, of course, with Governor Gary Johnson, uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but I forgot where I was. I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and was going through this and talking about competition, and people were kind of waving their fingers at me saying, well, no, Judge Gray, we, we've had school choice for 10 years. We don't have any bad sc public schools anymore. That competition has rooted them out. So it works, and this is something particularly for the lower economic classes, and unfortunately many minorities, that's where our schools are failing our children. That a lot of people here listening, you have school choice because, like, like me, you move to a neighborhood that has good schools. Of course, the prices are a little bit higher for those houses, but that's an important selling point. Or if you don't like the public schools, you can afford to send your child to a private school. So we have school choice. And, by the way, if in the public school you have a teacher that isn't doing his job or her job well, uh, I will go to the principal and I say, you know, not on my watch. My son is not going to be in that, in that class. I want him to get a better education and to have the muscle to be able to have him put into a different class. But, so if the poorer teachers are in good schools, they end up being on the outs, so they're usually almost always sent to schools that are not performing. And the, the parents there do not have the clout to keep that, from, that teacher from supposedly teaching their children. So we have numbers and numbers of teachers that cannot teach who are, in effect, re casting uh, aspersions upon children uh, in the lower economic areas. And you talk about a liberty. The importance of education is truly important with regard to the pursuit of happiness that is in the Constitution. So these are things that we need to do. In a libertarian government, who is going to be a winner? Students who are going to get good quality education because competition will do that. And who's going to win? Good teachers. They'll be in demand. So if they're a good teacher, they're doing a good job. If they're not being paid as well or getting the benefits as well in this school, they'll be lured over to another school because competition works. By the way, in a public school system today, uh, the teachers are not dumb, and the better teachers know where the money is, and it's an administration. As a result, we have a lot of the good teachers are rotated out of the classrooms into administrative jobs because they get higher pay. In private schools, they have many, many fewer bureaucrats. In public schools, it's compounded enormously. These things work. So who's going to work under a libertarian government? Who's going to win? Students and good teachers. Also, I'm, I'm involved with something called the World Affairs Council of Orange County here in California. And we, had, uh, we have speakers on foreign affairs. And we had former Ambassador Negroponte was talking with us. Very experienced fellow in the State Department. He was the ambassador to 
Philippines, I think it was, and Mexico and various other places. And in question and answer, he was asked, Ambassador Negroponte, what is the biggest security threat to the United States of America today? And without blinking an eye, he said, it's our deficits. You know, we are running now upwards of a trillion dollar a year deficits, and it's going to be a major security problem because our economy is the thing that keeps us strong. Look, which is the only party today that stands for financial responsibility, who stands in effect for the protection of our young people? I'm older. I'm going to be fine. I've got investments. I even have, an, have a uh, pension from, from being a judge. So I'm going to be fine. My children are in some trouble. And my grandchildren, if I ever have any, are bankrupt. And which political party is the one that stands for the protection of our young people? Only libertarians. So young people will become winners in a libertarian government because we will bring financial responsibility back which is unheard of in today's world, shame on us, what a legacy we're leaving. What other people, you know, healthcare professionals, we're going to bring back competition in our healthcare system. What we're doing today is just simply turning our healthcare system into something run by the equivalent of the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's where we're going. But we have to understand as libertarians, if you stand up now today politically and say, we're going to appeal, repeal Obamacare, you know, the so-called, I always say, so-called Affordable Care Act, you're going to tell about 65 to 70 percent of your listeners, I don't care about you, which is definitely a loser in politics. So we're going to have to replace it with something. And here I would simply, on a sliding scale, provide some vouchers to people based upon their economic situation, that they could use in the private market to purchase health care insurance and even, depending on their financial circumstances, to make some co-pays. But otherwise, get the government out of the health care system. It was doing fine when it was competitive, and now it's almost a train wreck. We're soon going to have insurance for all. Okay, fine, but no worthy Healthcare professionals will take the insurance, uh, and that's basically where we're going. We are running it into the ground. The only people that stand for excellence again in the healthcare system are libertarians. So, healthcare professionals and we patients will win. There's numbers of other things, uh, but a critically important one is, and I know I'm kind of going to run out of time. Members of the armed forces and their families are going to be winners in a libertarian world. Look in the Constitution, by the way, the greatest document written by the hand of mankind. Uh, and let me just give you a, a, a promo for myself. Uh, recently, I, with two partners, have written a musical, and it's entitled Convention, The Birth of America, and it's about the Constitutional Convention. No, it doesn't have any rap numbers in it, and it's not Hamilton, and it's also not 1776. But as a result, I've really been into the founders uh, of our country. And by the way, I say founders, not founding fathers, because even though all the delegates were male, but we had lots of women that were founders as well. Abigail Adams certainly comes to mind. But, but uh, at any rate, you look at the Constitution and the delegates, and they disagreed on lots of things, of course, slave or free, big states or small, all of that. But one thing universally that each delegate to the Constitutional Convention of 1787 believed is that the most important function of government is safeguarding our liberties and our freedoms from the encroachment of government. They all believed that. Security was number two. Come on, folks, how far have we gone away from that calling? Safeguarding our civil liberties from the government. We are abandoning that in so many ways, and that is simply atrocious. But in addition, the members of the armed forces, which I said are going to be winners, they will, if given orders to go to Iraq or Afghanistan or put themselves into combat areas, they will salute, say, yes, sir, and they will go. And, and they know full well that their chances may be of being injured mentally, physically, even killed, are unacceptably high. They do it anyway. They don't question it. They have an absolute right, an absolute right to know that they're being put into harm's way in order to safeguard and protect the United States security interests, the United States national interests. And how do we do that? We require a declaration of war from Congress, Article 1, Section 8, all over again. And how far have we gotten away from that? 
I, I'm completely convinced that had we required a secretary, excuse me, a declaration of war instead of the so-called Tonkin Gulf Resolution, uh, which was a cop-out by the, by the Congress to allow the president uh, to do what he felt was necessary in Vietnam, had we actually required a declaration of war, we would have looked at, okay, who are we fighting? Where are they? Why? What is the security threat to our country? What are our objectives? How will we know when we accomplish our objectives so we can have a, an end strategy? I don't believe that had we actually made Congress face those issues publicly, we would have gone into Vietnam. But if we would have, at least then we would have been unified as a people because, of course, eventually the people objected so strongly that, that we, we left Vietnam. Same thing with regard to Iraq. I was actually running for U.S. Senate at that time, uh, 2004, and said as publicly and openly as, as I could that if we put ground troops into Iraq without the full involvement and participation of the world community, it will be the biggest mistake of my lifetime. And nothing has happened since then to change my mind. It has really been a destabilizing force, and it's been the biggest mistake of my lifetime. But had we required a declaration of war, hey, who is it that we're going to be fighting? What is our objective? How is this a security interest uh, threat to the United States? I do not believe that Congress would have issued that declaration of war. We never would have done it. Afghanistan? Okay, yes, the, Afghanistan did not cause 9-11, which was definitely a... a act of war against our country, but they kind of condoned it, looked the other way while Osama bin Laden was doing this. So what should we have done? Go into Iraq, declare war on the people that had, that had perpetrated that atrocity on us, would have taken us, what, 30, 60, maybe even 90 days to find them, to bring them to justice, and then leave. And then leave. We're still there. And in fact, uh, we just went to the California State Libertarian Convention last weekend, and I met a guy by the name of Scott Horton, and I'm going to give him a shout out, because he was a speaker there and talked about how we got into Afghanistan, how we in effect were trapped into going into Afghanistan, and how we should, how we should get out now. He's written a book called Fool's Errand, I recommend it to you, Fool's Errand by Scott Horton. But these are things that the country needs to focus on, quietly, softly, but firmly. So members of the armed forces should be voting libertarian because we are the only ones that stand for that principle. We will not put them into these situations unless our interests are really at stake. I became, <laughs> I did something, and, and maybe some of you are aware of this, uh, Back in 1992, as a sitting trial court judge in Orange County, California, and I held a press conference. Judges do not do that. But based upon my experience as a criminal defense attorney in the Navy, Navy JAG Corps, a uh, federal prosecutor in Los Angeles, and then I'd been on the bench for about uh, nine years by that time, I wanted to call attention to as many people as I could that our nation's drug policy of drug prohibition was not working. And it wasn't, and it isn't. And Fortunately, we're finally, finally, I mean, it's been years since 1992, but finally at least we're regulating and controlling marijuana, and the rest of the other drugs will start to line up and, and follow, uh, probably under some form of medicalized program. But we are the only ones. We should take credit for this revolution with regard to marijuana. We should take credit for saving numbers and numbers of lives. And over-incarceration is an issue of concern to libertarians. In fact, I just read a book uh, called uh, Just Mercy, which is uh, about the death penalty being imposed in uh, Alabama and in Georgia, even in the 1980s, uh, mostly, of course, against African Americans, some of whom were factually innocent. But libertarians care about these things. Over-incarceration, the United States of America, with 5% of the world's population, has 20% of its prisoners. As uh, former Senator, U.S. Senator Jim Webb from Virginia said, either we're the most criminally oriented society in the world or we're doing something wrong. Which do you think it is? And the criminal justice system with these three strikes and you're out penalties and all of the enhancements and all of that sort of thing is just overdoing taking away liberty from people. Uh, if, if you're going to be violent and, you're, you, and there are people like this, uh, they should be in prison. 
And a lot of people out there see us as their lawful prey, and you can't counsel them, you can't get to them, you have to remove them from society. But, of course, you treat them humanely when you do that. But many, many people are there. I would say tens of thousands of people are in prison today just in my state of California that simply should not be there. And we stand for this, and by the way, it's a terribly expensive thing for the taxpayers as well, but taking, depriving people of their liberty uh, without just cause or for unduly long periods of time is simply fundamentally wrong from every standpoint. Libertarians stand for that. People who want to pursue their occupations. In about the 1970s, uh, in the state of California, again, I'm more familiar with that because it's my state, we needed about 7% of the people working were required to have licenses in order to pursue their occupation. Now it's over 20%. I mean, come on, why? If you braid hair, for example, why should you need a government license to be able to do that? Uh, and by the way, if you, and you're required to go to some form of, of, of beauty school and uh, they don't even you pay money. You have to get hours of training. They don't even teach you to braid hair. Let the customer decide. If people get bonded, have insurance, that should be enough. The insurance company will make sure that at least you're not going to cut people with knives or whatever. But uh, otherwise, get the government out of that bond, that 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 uh, uh, licensing area. And uh, the same thing with trimming trees. Or, it's just there are too many things that now require government intrusion into our lives. Let the customers decide, and that's the way to go. Libertarians stand for that. How can you get in the, in, up on the ladder, the economic ladder, unless you can get on the first rung? So these are people that are going to be successful. Well, of course, talking taxpayers as well, uh, we would reduce taxes, uh, reduce spending, and uh, no one else, they don't even give lip service to that. Who would lose in a libertarian system? Well, shouldn't be hard to figure out. Teachers who cannot teach are recipients of corporate welfare, what I call crony capitalism. I think it was last year, something in the order, I can't remember, $20 million was spent paying farmers not to grow corn. Hey, look, I'll raise my hand. I can not grow corn with the best of them. Pay me too. And that's something that would simply not happen in a libertarian government. We would require people to go on the common, on the regular free market and, and take your chances. You want to buy crop insurance? Bless you. That's just fine. But people involving corporate welfare, uh, building athletic stadiums, for heaven's sakes, uh, all of that sort of thing, uh, tariffs, all of these things are, are crony capitalism and would be done. Uh, so prison guards unions wouldn't do very well either, by the way. Imagine having a vested interest in taking away other people's liberty so that you can have a higher paying job or more job security. Fundamentally, fundamentally wrong. So these are things that we need to look at. We're proud as libertarians. We need to get the word out. When I was again running for vice president in 2012, I would fly into various towns, cities, and be met there at the airport by what I called my mother hen. So one or two people would escort me around. They would drive me around their state or even multiple states. They'd pay their own expenses with their own, uh, and we'd stay in Motel 6s or something like that, which were fine, by the way, clean, fresh, uh, quiet. Uh, showers were fine. But uh, they were really wonderful. They'd pay their own gasoline. They just would help doing this. I, would, I, I thought they were intelligent, caring people. We have, I put our libertarians up against anyone in the world, but there aren't enough of us. We need to spread the word. We need to get this out, and when better than now. We just elected a guy named Jeff Hewitt uh, to the Board of Supervisors in Riverside County, which neighbors Orange County. Uh, that's a big start. But we've been a political party since the early 1970s. We have not elected people. We must do that. Find good candidates for local office, the city council, the board of supervisors, uh, community, uh, various community activities, and show what libertarians would do in government, how we would adopt the best solutions, have the free enterprise system work a great deal more. Uh, for example, in California, we have what we call Caltrans, or California Transportation Agency. I don't believe that the state of California should own any dump trucks. You know, if we're going to have a Caltrans, they should oversee public 
contracts with private entities and let the private companies own the dump trucks and, and we would just oversee those contracts to maintain, fix, create our roads. This is not difficult, but it's the vested interests that are causing these problems. So go back to Thomas Jefferson, and maybe we can open it up then for questions. Go back to Thomas Jefferson, who said, literally, quote, we're going to need a bloody revolution every generation in order to keep the vested interests at bay. Now, I would quickly say that the Constitution uh, keeps the revolution from having to be bloody, but how long has it been since we've had a political revolution in our country? Probably back in the 1860s when the Republicans took over from the Whigs. How long has it been? And look at the vested interests since then. It is unbelievable. They're strong. Of course, they don't want to give up their power, and I understand that, but we need to shine a light on what is actually happening with these vested interests around our country. And who better to do that than us libertarians? I'm proud to be a libertarian. I'm glad to be able to share thoughts with you this evening. I've been rambling a little bit, and there's an awful lot to talk about, but maybe we can open up for questions and see what some of your thoughts are. While we're doing that, <clears throat> again, let me remind you that I do have this One Man's Libertarian white paper. Uh, Jess will provide a copy to you. And then the last comment will be, I have a question. Maybe the first person can answer it. Uh, what do you call a cow that's just given birth? Okay? What do you call a cow that's just given birth? And I know that out, some of you out there are saying, aha, the answer is decaffeinated. Okay? That's my attempted humor for the day. Cheer up, I'll throw one more at you before we're done. But maybe we can open up for some questions, Jess. I expect that there's some good ones out there. There are some good ones. We've been getting some questions in. And thank you so much for taking the time to drop some truth bombs on the call as well as share some really great information about the criminal justice system. And for everyone that's joined the call since we got started, you've been hearing from Judge Jim Gray. And we are going to switch now to question and answer. If you would like to ask a question for the judge, please send me an email at jeff.mears at lp.org and I will, um, I will ask the question. So the first one is a great one because we just ended on this exact topic. Um, everyone has received the white paper in their email, so you can take a look at that via your email. And since Judge Gray has uh, shared his email address publicly, I will send that out to everyone tomorrow morning. David asks, how do we get there from where we are now without a bloody revolution? Do you see any change anytime soon? Jess, this is Judge Gray. Uh, I can barely hear you. We're having some technical problems. Okay. Can you hear me a little better now? No. Okay. I'm going to take off my headphones. Okay. How's this? Is this better? Hello? I will try to listen really hard. I can barely hear you, but I'll, I'll hang in there. Let's keep going. Hi, Judge Gray. Can you hear me okay? I'm getting some feedback from individuals on the call that they can hear me all right, so maybe if you turn up your volume. Yes, you, I can hear you better now. Let's move okay. on. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I did let everybody know that I will be sending your email address to them, and we're going to switch to Q&A right now. David, Bur David asks, how do we get there from where we are now without a bloody revolution? Did you, do you see any change anytime soon? Hey, Judge Gray, can you hear me okay? Let's give it a few minutes to see if uh, we can get Judge Gray to hear me and see if we can keep this call rolling. Judge Gray, are you able to hear me? 
Yes, I can now, but you'll have okay. to repeat the question, please. All right. We're, let's let's uh, move on to questions. David asks, how do we get there from where we are now without a bloody revolution? Do you see a change anytime soon? Well, David, yes, I do. Uh, I think our time is wonderful now. It's never been better. People are anxious to receive what we would do. So we just need to get out there and, and blow the horns and, and hit the drums uh, and, and, and show people actively what we're doing. Uh, by the way, uh, another commercial promotion for me, uh, I'm really excited that this coming, coming Friday, which is April 19, which happens to, would have been my mother's 101st birthday, I'm going to initiate a radio show. It's for an hour on the Voice America uh, station. It's on the Internet. It's called All Rise, the Libertarian Way with Judge Jim Gray. All Rise, the Libertarian Way with Judge Jim Gray. And the, the theme there will be, if we adopt libertarian approaches, we all will rise, and uh, except the special interests. So please tune in. You can get the Voice America mobile app. Go to voiceamerica.com and listen. It's, at, send, it's on Friday mornings at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, 7 o'clock on Pacific time. So that's just one way I can do it, but we all can do something. We all can talk with our friends. This is a grassroots movement, but we just have to get more assertive, get out there and show what is going to happen. People are polarized. People are angry, and I think they have a right to be because they believe our institutions are not working. And that means the judicial system, you know, those Kavanaugh hearings and all the politics of getting a, an appointment uh, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, they think that the Congress is just out for their little petty victories and, instead of having our interests at heart, and I agree with them. The presidency, we've never seen anything like this, uh, where, where it's just a phenomenon that just is embarrassing to me. The timing could not be better. Now is the time for us to get into our stride and show our country that help is, in, help is on the way and it's brought by libertarians. It's going to happen. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Here's a question from Jacob. He asked, what is the balance between limiting government to what is absolutely necessary in the name of liberty and governing by the will of the people? It seems as though most of the people are content submitting to the state, raising the question of democracy versus liberty. Jacob, you're right. Uh, most people are content with that. Uh, if you're going to run, as unfortunately Gary Johnson did, saying, you know, uh, liberty is live free. You know, it sounds good. Oh, sure, I'd like to live free, but it's not a winner because it doesn't help me put rice in my bowl or get my children educated as such. So that's where most voters are interested. Not many will try to vote for a, or decide to vote for a candidate so that we can save the whales, although some do. But... We need to show where government can work and where government cannot, and where better to start than that brilliant Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. You know, it does say that California is not a state to negotiate uh, trade deals with uh, Japan. No, that's the federal issue, and uh, set up a federal judiciary. I would try to have a constitutional amendment and have the post office, uh, in effect, be, be privatized with you know, FedEx and UPS could do a lot better job, but there are things there in the Constitution that basically say what the government should be doing. And then there was something called the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Hey, remember those? They're in our Constitution, where if, unless a power is delegated by the Constitution to the federal government, no, it's reserved for what? The states and the people. And we just need to emphasize that because big government, I assure you, Jacob, is really, really good and effective at one thing, and that's increasing the size and the power and the cost of big government. And we've seen that continually for the last number of decades. We need to stand up and say, wait a minute, no, let's go back to what we really should be doing with government, and that is, yes, an army and some police forces and the rest of that, and leave the building of roads to the private sector. But, but that's the balance. Uh, we can all differ as far as the degree, but let's talk about it. And uh, I'm sure glad I'm in the libertarian camp, not really for philo philosophical reasons, although that's there too. What we talk about works. What we talk about from a pragmatic, practical standpoint is much more effective. In fact, quickly, 
And when I'm talking with people, I say, you know, if you want to look at the difference between what government would do as opposed to private foundations or private sector, think mosquito nets. People look at you like, what are you talking about? And then I say, there are many countries, many in Africa, where, of course, malaria is still a substantial problem. And it is shown that for every 10 mosquito nets you get on the ground covering people's beds at night, you're going to probably save a life. And it costs the federal, it costs the government something in the order of $10.20 per mosquito net, and it costs private foundations about $4.70. It's far less than, than, than half in the, the same mosquito net. The private sector does it better, and that's what we need to focus on. But yes, Jacob, uh, we do need a balance in government. That's where I would start, back with the Constitution, and I think that there's a great deal of, of uh, practicality in all of that. I'll remember that mosquito nets example, and I'll be sure to use it a few times. Here yes, I'm losing you again. Oh. Can you turn up your volume? I'm just on a phone. Okay. But I heard you that right. time. Okay. You mentioned universal basic income in your white paper. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, assuming you're suggesting universal basic income as a position, what sorts of program are you suggesting? Good. Who asked that question? Um, there's no name. Okay, there's no name. You know, I'm going to quote Milton Friedman again. This is the first place I found it. He called it a negative income tax. I don't like the word negative, so I use a stipend. But let me tell you his program, which I endorse. Let's start with the tax situation. We would go to a graduated flat tax. The first, and this, I'll take me about three minutes to explain this, but I think it's really important. No one, for example, and I'll just use numbers for, for uh, illustra illustrative purposes, no one would pay any income tax on their first $30,000 of income. Not you, me, Bill Gates, no one. Then for every dollar you would earn between thirty and dollars and $100,000, you would pay $0.10 cents to the federal government. I don't care how you spend your money. That's just what you would do. For every dollar that you earned, if you were fortunate, between $100,000 and $500,000, for those dollars you would pay $0.15 cents of each dollar to the government. And if you were Kobe Bryant or Stephon Curry or something and earned more than $500,000 a year, each of those dollars you'd pay, let's say, $0.22 cents to the government. Again, end of discussion. Now, what about people that make no money? And I don't care if you're lazy, you just lost your job to a robot, you want to go back to school, I don't care. As long as you're 18 years of age and are a citizen or have a green card, we will give you a stipend of $15,000 a year, probably broken down into 12 monthly payments of $1,250. But, importantly, for every dollar you did make, between a zero and thirty thousand dollars, you'd lose fifty cents of your stipend. So you would always have an incentive to earn the extra dollar, which is totally untrue in today's social security or welfare or whatever else, which is really ridiculous. So you have an incentive to earn the extra dollar. That's where I would go and do away with all other welfare programs unless you're truly in special needs, which is a different issue. And Milton Friedman would say, you know, the difference between the poor and the wealthy are. The wealthy have money and the poor don't, so give them money. And people say, oh, well, wait a minute. What if they're, you know, they're going to go out and spend it on drugs or alcohol or racetracks or whatever? Well, if they need a conservatorship, that's a different issue. But let's not get waylaid. That's just a different issue. Make it direct. Now, let me also tell you, I'm really concerned about the homeless in our country. And I'll quickly say that, look, I could be bleeding on the street right here at your feet, and you would have no legal obligation to help me unless you caused my injuries, which was different. But we will because we want to, because we're compassionate people. We don't have to. Just because I'm alive doesn't mean that you owe me any money, but we will because we're compassionate people. So what about the homeless? Well, let's see. If they were to have the equivalent of $1,250 a month in their ATM account or whatever, the private sector would quickly come out with some form of board and care facility, maybe dormitory living, whatever, but a roof over your head and you'd have two or three meals a day and they would be able to take maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand of those dollars a month, leaving you an extra 250 to buy your various necessities. The private sector would work. So that's what I would do 
it's, it's not really the universal basic income. It would be, in effect, a program of stipends with incentives. So no name. You asked me. It's maybe a long-winded answer, but I'm completely convinced that it would work. Do away with the, all this other welfare. Imagine the bureaucracy, the, the, the fraud, the, the manipulation, the degradation, and the lack of incentives. All of those would be reversed under this system. I'm proud of it, and uh, again, congratulations to Dr. Friedman. Okay, thank you for answering that question. The next one comes from one of uh, longtime members of the Libertarian Party, D. Frank Robinson. He's in Oklahoma, and his question is, can the Libertarian Party have electoral success while the duopoly parties monopolize and censor the ballot to deny voters an equal opportunity to choose candidates? Yes, I, I'm sorry, I just can't hear you. I, I, I may have to try to speak up or something because you're going in and out. Sure. Is this better? Not really. Okay. <laughs> How is this? Okay, just try it again, please. Okay. This question is from D. Frank Robinson. He asks, can the Libertarian Party have electoral success while the duopoly parties monopolize and censor the ballot to deny voters an equal opportunity to choose candidates? That's a tough one. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is we're never going to be viable in the presidential election unless and until we're in the debates. And we brought a lawsuit actually from 2012, uh, and we lost. Uh, we lost at the trial court level. We lost at the appellate level where I thought they were disingenuous, that they ignored some really good precedents and cases that we had, and the Supreme Court did not grant certiorari, which means that they didn't come in on it either. Uh, can we have ballot success? There are ways th that we can do this. Uh, I can't remember the state, I think it was Vermont, that had um, uh, weighted voting in which say there were five candidates running for the city council, and one of them you thought was just great, and yeah, I'll vote for candidate one, but there are two others that I could accept, so I'll vote for candidates one, three, and five. Numbers two and four are just not somebody I would want at all. So each of those votes counts, and everybody does that, and then you just add up the votes and see which candidate gets the most votes. So it does away with that uh, you know, wasted vote syndrome. It allows people to vote their conscience, but also is, allows them to vote for acceptable candidates. If we were to change the system in that way, it would be great. Uh, if we could change the system to what's called an automatic runoff, where everybody votes, and you're, my first candidate is this one, but if they, they generate all of those first, they count up all of those votes, if no one wins a 50% or one, then you take out the less the, the voter, the uh, candidate that had the least votes, and we would have voted for our second choice as well. So if we vote for the one that is removed, then they're going to count our second vote. And so at that point, you have an automatic runoff. Computers can do that pretty easily, and you keep doing that until someone gets 50% plus one. Uh, these are not all that difficult. The vested interests don't like it. Certainly the Republicans and Democrats don't like it. But once it starts going and m making its way, uh, it's going to gain impetus, and this will be helpful. But uh, mostly we're going to have to run good people, again, like Jeff Hewitt and the Board of Supervisors, start at the lower level, uh, and unless we get in the presidential debates or even the votes for U the debates for U.S. Senate, we'll never be viable. But once we pick up candidates at the lower level and move them up, which is where we should be spending a great deal of time, all of us can do that. We can all walk precincts. We can all find good, uh, maybe middle-aged or somewhat younger people and bring them up through the ranks. And uh, that's where I think we'll really make our contributions. Here is the next question. It comes from Dave. Dave has a little bit longer of a question with a statement. He says, if the government provides a service for someone and someone chooses to use that service, he or she should pay a fee. Taxation is theft. No one should be forced to pay taxes. There is no such thing as government's money. There is taxpayers' money stolen by the government to waste on illegal wars, spying, and our on our electronic conversations, enforcing needless regulation on individual freedom, et cetera. 
How can you justify forcing anyone to pay taxes to educate someone else or pay for health care vouchers or any other reason? Well, Dave, you raise some really valid points. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm an incrementalist. Uh, I would go that way if I could. The chances of doing that are non-existent. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to ha- make things a little bit better. Uh, if we go for that home run, uh, we'll be the same place in 2031 that we're in now uh, because it just isn't going to work. So I would much prefer to show people, again, yes, taxation is theft, point of a gun, and the rest of that, but at least let's reduce those taxes, let's, re- let's reduce the size of big government, let's take property that that the federal government owns in so many western states and give it back to those states or hopefully back to the people i mean we can do things incrementally so that 20 years from now we will be a lot closer to what you want uh, than we would be if we were to simply go to try to hit that home run so it is a matter of incrementalism uh government is here to stay to some degree you know we do need an army uh, we do need a Navy. Uh, we do need people in the State Department, that sort of thing. So, so uh, as a practical matter, as well as a philosophical matter, uh, let's go incrementally and show people the, the libertarian way works so we can get closer to what you say instead of pontificating and, and taking these, these philosophical positions and feeling really good about ourselves uh, but not making any progress. Okay, we have nine more minutes and two questions. So if you have a question, feel free to send it in. We might still be able to get to it. Here is a question from Ramiro. Ramiro says, libertarian ideas will be hard to implement while we allow companies or anyone to lobby the government. They use the government for their own benefit. How can we stop this? Do you agree that that lobbying is a problem for libertarian ideas? Well, um Romero, of course. Uh, The problem is, of course, too, I think people should register so that at least folks are aware of what this person is doing. By the way, talk about money. Uh, I opened my newspaper about a month ago and saw that Barbara Boxer, whom I had run against again, she was then a United States senator, now she's not, and she all of a sudden was writing uh, an editorial in favor of uh, water... uh, conversion, uh, salt water conversion plants, which he was totally against as a politician, but you look a little further and, okay, she's a lobbyist now. She's being paid to do this. So money matters. Money matters much too much in government. In fact, government is money. But we're always going to have lobbyists, so we need to have an institutional way of blunting what the lobbyists are able to do. And I don't fault lobbyists. It's just their job, but they should disclose it. But one way of doing that, and you talk about something interesting, and this was not original idea with me, when we first had our House of Representatives, they had 13 states, and each one represented somewhere between 25 and 30,000 constituents all across the 13, column, the 13 states. What if we were to go back to that? Because today, most representatives are representing somewhere in the order of 500 to 700,000 uh, voters. So what if we were to go back to that system where each one represented about 30 to 35,000? Well, if you do a little calculation, that would mean we'd end up with somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 members of Congress. Okay, hey, not a bad idea. How about let's have all of them stay home? They, in, with regard to the Internet today, they can caucus privately or publicly. They can have meetings. They can vote uh, secretly or publicly. They can do all of those things. They can communicate with each other, but stay home. They can have a home office, save a whole lot of money in travel, a lot more local that you'd see your representative at your local market or at a baseball game or whatever else, and imagine – the difficulty of a lobbyist trying to buttonhole five or 6,000 people all around the country. So that would blunt the whole lobbyist thing enormously. Uh, have the U.S. Senate stay the way they are, but have all of these representatives pay them just a small amount of money, but also have them, of course, have other work. I think that that would be a sensational thing to do to blunt the lobbyist movements and to bring back 
local elections and uh, and localities it would just i think be a striking thing to do so that's it might be a little difficult to implement because it's not constitutional uh you would have to go through congress to get them to vote on it uh which is a very unlikely thing to have happen but if it became a groundswell of opinion on that uh it could it could happen but i think that's intriguing romero and that's something that that i would implement but otherwise you know we're Lobbyists are here to stay. They are powerful. And if you go even to uh, having um, numbers of, of uh, uh, what is it, uh, you can only be a, a member of Congress for so long, say five terms, ten years, uh, the lobbyists are going to get even stronger because the lobbyists will stay and the people that are running for office uh, will be termed out, and so uh, uh, they would they would have less power and less understanding. So these are inherent problems. You heard it here first. Life is complicated. Uh, let's just do the best we can. But I think spreading some of these ideas, like going back to the number of uh, 30,000 to 35,000 per representative and having them stay home, would be a sensational thing for democracy and libertarian values. Good advice. Here is a question from Laura. She asks, how can we leverage veterans in the grassroots movement? How can we leverage veterans, did you say? Mm -hmm. That is correct. One of the, and thank you for bringing that up, Laura, one of the biggest breaches of contract that I am aware of is between us, that is our government, and veterans. Uh, and, and I'm involved with something called Veterans Legal Institute. I'm on their board of directors where we provide free legal advice to veterans. But there are so many of our, of our vets that have come back from their tours of duty uh, with physical or even more, more mental problems that they carry with them. It should be the requirement of government. The burden should be on the government to show that particular malady that you have or condition was not caused by your service instead of the other way around. Uh, and we owe it to these heroes uh, that have kept us free, or at least to some degree, uh, and go to, to fight uh, without questioning their orders. So that is something that I, I think that we all should do. Libertarians stand for veterans. I already told you about making sure that when they're going to go off and fight in the combat areas that it will be for legitimate purposes. But we would also, libertarians abhor breaches of contract, and this is a breach of contract that I think should be made right, and libertarians should be in the vanguard of making this happen. And that is something that we should use when we run for office, and we should mean it. We I'm going to ask one more question, Jess. Uh, I promise to do it, and we're running out of time. What do you call an animal that has no, ha, only has a nose and nothing else? What do you call an animal that just has a nose and nothing else? And, of course, the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> Last question. We have three more minutes, and it will be my question for you. What was your favorite memory from running for vice president in 2012? Oh, thank you. It was the people. Uh, I can tell you it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. I took it seriously. I was representing my, my political party, and I was representing to everyone uh, to make things better, in effect, all rise. Uh, that, was, that was just the, the thing, that, the takeaway. We, we have such good people. There aren't enough of us. But it was also enormously frustrating because I felt then and I felt now that uh, – Johnson and Gray were more qualified and more able to do good things for our country than anyone else running, which was back then uh, Joe Biden with Obama and, with, and uh, Romney with, uh, with Ryan. Uh, and in fact, when Governor Johnson asked me to be his running mate in the same conversation, he said, Jim, through the election campaign, if you disagree with me, feel free to say so publicly. I asked him later where that came from, and he said, you know, when I was governor, I told the same thing to my cabinet members, but just be sure you're right. So this, is, this was just really exhilarating. On the other hand, Jess, it was one of the most frustrating experiences because we just didn't get any traction. And uh, I still remember in Ohio, we were doing really well, but Ohio is a swing state. We had a poll about three weeks before the election, and we were something like 15% of the voters in Ohio. But when it came down to it, 
It was a close election for, for people, and they voted against either Romney or against Obama, and so they voted for the lesser of two evils, which, by the way, you still get evil. So we ended up with only like 3% of the vote after that because of the wasted vote syndrome. It was just very frustrating because I felt we had a lot to offer. The world would be a better place today had we won. And uh, the world will be a better place in 2020 when the libertarian candidates for president and vice president win. Thank you so much, Judge Gray, for taking all of our questions and for sharing all of this knowledge this evening. This call was recorded, and it will be shared with the individuals that signed up for this call. Do you have anything else you wish to say tonight before we end the call? Yes, I do. Thank you for what you're doing. You know, membership manager, there's so many people in the Libertarian Party that are behind the scenes, that are working, devoting their attention, uh, and of course people like Dan Fishman too, I'm just excited about that. But I'm proud to be a Libertarian, I'm proud to share thoughts with fellow Libertarians, but there's a trap in that, you know, sitting around and figuring out how smart we are uh, without sharing those thoughts with others uh, is, is simply not going to help us get to where we want to be. So... Uh, Thank you. We're going to get it done. I'm optimistic. And besides, it's the only game in town. We will all rise as libertarians. By the way, join me on uh, All Rise, the Libertarian Way with Judge Jim Gray. It will be this coming Friday, the 19th of, uh, of April, on thevoiceamerica.com. So those are my thoughts. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but it certainly is fun and exhilarating sharing those with good people. Good luck to us all. Thank you, Judge Gray. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and look for the follow-up email from me tomorrow morning. Have a good night.